much for being here. My name is Ann Hinterman. I am the Director of Housing in the 46th Ward for Alderman James Kappelman. And on behalf of Alderman Kappelman and our co-sponsor, State Senator Sarah Feigenholds, I'm so glad to have you joining this conversation. We have this presentation thanks to Michelle Gilbert, who is the Policy Director for the Lawyers Committee for Better Housing. She is going to talk about LCBH's new eviction prevention program and share some information about new rules around eviction that came out of the governor's latest announcement. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle. Good morning, everyone. I uh, first want to express my appreciation to our sponsors, Alderman Kappelman's office and Senator, State Senator Sarah Feigenholt. The timeliness of this presentation, which of course was scheduled weeks ago, could not be better because it is super important that right now we engage in community education about the changes in the governor's moratorium. Um, I'm going to go through some slides. I'm going to go through it quickly so that we have plenty of time for discussion. I'm sure that people have questions. And as Maggie said, we'll share the slides afterwards. So don't worry if you can't catch the websites, you'll be able to, to pull them up from the slides. So, um, the Lawyers Committee for Better Housing is a 40 year old legal aid organization and uh, court reform and building court uh, reform organization started on the north side. Um, and uh, we now represent people throughout the city um, and, and in the suburbs, although our practice is mostly uh, in the city and at the Daily Center. Um, in the summer, as the impact of the pandemic uh, was obvious on the economy and on housing stability, we were fortunate that the City of Chicago Department of Housing extended a grant to us to begin the Chicago COVID eviction prevention project. Um, and prevention is very intentionally chosen as the word there because the best eviction case I can handle is the one that I can prevent from being filed. Um, I may say some things from a tenant's perspective because I'm now an old legal aid attorney, having been done this, been doing this for 30 years. Um, but this is really a time for landlords and tenants to come together to encourage housing assistance for landlords who needs pay, who need payments. Um, and uh, to protect uh, people from becoming homeless doubled up so that we can stop the spread of the virus. Uh, one thing that I love about LCBH is we not only have our legal side, but we have a supportive services side to the agency that administers housing assistance grants. We have three funding streams now. I'll talk more about it as I go through it, but we're trying with the tools that we have to get housing assistance out to landlords and tenants to prevent displacement. Uh, can you still see me? And the, can you still see the slides? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Oh, great. Because <laughs> everyone disappeared. I was afraid I'd broken something. Uh, I want to first say that this is legal information. If somebody, and I'm happy to answer general questions. If you're currently experiencing a legal situation, I'll give you information on how to contact us, but you don't want to put confidential legal questions in the chat. Also, th this is largely based on our practice here in Cook County, which is probably where most of you are as well. Um, some of it is relevant outside of Cook County, but sometimes I'm not going to know that to those things. I'm going to talk first a little bit about the, the pre-COVID eviction process uh, it, in that it helps us understand what changes have been made. Uh, before any landlord can file an eviction, they have to file a termination notice, uh, not file, I'm sorry, deliver a termination notice, five days at least for non-payment, 10 days for other causes other than non-payment or 30 days uh, at the end of uh, tenancy or if there's a month to month tenancy. 
they have to file a complaint in court and uh, have a summons issued. The summons has to be attempted by the sheriff, and if not the sheriff, it, pardon me, they can use a special process server or it can be served by posting, uh, which is not posting on a door, but posting at the daily center. The landlord or landlord's attorney has to go before judge, present the uh, termination notice and some more evidence and the judge, only a judge can enter an eviction order and only a uh, sheriff can execute an eviction order. So even if the um, landlord get, you know, goes to court and gets the eviction order, they still have to give it to the sheriff to enforce it. They can't engage in any self-help enforcement which we also call lockouts, which I'll revisit a couple of times. So I'll just say really briefly, one thing that Lawyers Committee for Better Housing does is study eviction court data. Um, you may be familiar with the book Evicted by Matthew Desmond and the fact that evictions were studied very little um, until the last few years. Not surprisingly, we fi find a um, racially disproportionate impact on communities of color, and uh, especially on black women with children. Studies have found that even when uh, uh, black and white tenants are matched for economic status, uh, evictions still impact communities of color. And here are some resources if you're interested in pursuing this issue, I recommend, I really love the book Color of Law. It is legalistic, but it's it's written in, in a way you don't need to be a lawyer to understand. The book Family Properties is really good too because it takes place in Chicago and, and just helps us understand the effect of legal segregation on where we are, not just with housing, um, but evictions as well. These are two, uh, well, one's a podcast and one's a film also. So the uh, COVID pandemic has led to five changes in the law. The governor's moratorium, so from April 23rd until November 14, the governor's moratorium prohibits uh, pretty much all evictions except those filed for health and safety reasons but that all changed last Friday, which is why this is so timely. The new executive order issued uh, last Friday only protects from eviction those people who are a covered person. And that is someone who gives their landlord a declaration that they have earned less money, uh, less than 99,000, which is a pretty high limit. I don't think anyone's gonna have a problem with that one, or that they got, uh, uh, CARES Act stimulus check, that they have COVID economic impact, they have made payments to the best of their ability, and that they will become homeless, including doubled up. Uh, the declaration itself is a little bit more complicated than that, but that's kind of a summary of the four points. Note that is only people who give their landlord the declaration. The uh, executive order requires landlords to give all residents of the premises a blank declaration for them to be able to fill out. Um, uh, but even if these things are true, as God and you know Jack Nicholson might know them to be true, um, it only prevents eviction if the tenant gives the declaration. It also prohibits enforcement of all eviction orders, except for health and safety violations. So again, back to the slide about the sheriff, even if the landlord has an eviction order due to non-payment, they can't enforce it while this moratorium is not in place unless there's a finding of health and safety violations. So uh, this is a, a graph. I hope it helps people understand. It helps me a little bit. This is, um, and when I prepared it, those circles were orange, sorry. Um, 
The small circle were the evictions that were or oval, small oval are the evictions that were allowed uh, from April 23rd to November 14th. This change in the moratorium changes completely the colors so that now the only evictions that are, are prohibited instead of being the whole bigger circle is the smaller blue circle. So only those non-payment evictions where there's COVID related economic impact and the declaration is provided. Now there could have been a more um, discreet ordinance, I mean moratorium um, that just addressed the people who were not paying rent even though they had uh, no COVID economic impact. Um, by just creating another exception, but that's not the way the ordinance went. These are the people that we are concerned about. The uh, people who have COVID economic impact, but don't have the connection to the media or computers or, uh, you know, they're just trying to live their life and they're not noticing as things change day by day. And they don't know that even though these things are true for them, they need to provide a declaration. And so that's why I'm hoping as we circulate these materials, you can help get them out to people. Our um, part of Lawyers Committee is a computer program called Rentervention. It uses plain language and a chat bot to give people information. Uh, they can create the um, declaration, which is not written. I think I've said this already. It's not written in very plain language, but uh, the Rentervention chat bot can help them choose options and create it. I put the Rentervention site in the chat already, and I'll do that again. Now, are there downsides to filling out the declaration? It must be signed under penalty of perjury. So people who have been withholding their rent because they thought it was better to, I don't know, put it in their certificate of deposit. I'm not trying to make light of it because uh, I think that those folks have done a disservice to all other tenants. But people who were putting money somewhere else and not paying the rent, even though it still had it, should not sign a declaration. Um, and it, it does create an admission that you are behind in rent. We are happy to talk to any tenants, either going to the chat bot or going through the chat bot and, and entering our virtual clinic or, or checking that you want to talk to an attorney. Um, we're happy to talk to any tenants who have questions about whether they should fill it out. Um, Having just said to the landlord, look, I'm out of my job, I can't pay rent is not good enough. The landlord or the tenant has to give the declaration in writing. Um, and a tenant should do that in a way that they can prove. Um, if you get the declaration through rentervention, it gets emailed to you and you can email it to your landlord and then you have proof that you have it. Um, Again, the new executive order still allows evictions against people who have uh, created health and safety violations. Um, and allows the enforcement of uh, evictions against the health and safety violations and prohibits all other actual evictions by the sheriff. Okay, so that's one change in the law. The second change in the law, which you heard about is the CARES Act, from which many of us got a stimulus check, that landlord, the landlord tenant protections are mostly ended. However, there are mortgage relief protections that some um, tenants, I'm sorry, that some property owners may still be able to access. And uh, property owners should contact their lender. I did a presentation yesterday with Wells Fargo where they were just really pleading for people who had this situation to reach out to them and to help work, work out um, forbearance or other sort of repayment. People who have federally involved mortgages 
who get forbearance from uh, Fannie Mae or a government agency are prohibited from filing evictions. In Cook County, there were court orders that closed the courts mostly from March 13 to July 6. Also, the sheriff has not served summons and eviction since March 13, except for health and safety violations. There are evictions orders that were entered before March 13 that still haven't been executed. And again, because of the moratorium as well as court orders, they can't be executed until at least December 13, which really is going to turn into January. It does mean that there is uh, quite a bit of mess of paperwork in the courts. They have gone to virtual trials over Zoom. Anyone who gets any court papers, re remembering back to those forms I started with, if you've got it, you talk to anyone who's gotten court papers like that, they should be trying to talk to an attorney or an advocate who understands them. Uh, people can look up if they have a case by going to Dorothy Brown's website. They can put in their name and search if there's been a case. All right. Our fourth area of law is that for the city of Chicago, the city council passed a COVID-19 ordinance. And this was really the genesis of our project. And the focus of the ordinance is that landlords and tenants should try to reach out agreement, try to reach agreements. So it requires an additional notice um, that you know can be delivered with a five-day notice, can be delivered with the new governor's declaration. Um, and if the tenant indicates the COVID economic impact, and it doesn't have to be a special form, it can be anything, then the landlord should try to make reasonable attempts to reach a settlement. It does prevent a few other things, something that I really love, and uh, thank you, Alderman Kaplan, if you can hear me out there, um, is that it requires landlords and tenants to work together to accept rental assistance. Nothing that I have mentioned in all of these changes in the law stop the clock on eviction or on I'm sorry on rental charges. So rent continues to accrue. Uh, there has been no rental holiday or or moratorium on rent payments, and and for the most part, little some details here and there. But for the most part, they don't prevent charging late fees or penalties. Now, some of the laws prohibit excessive late fees, um, which shouldn't be a problem in Chicago anyway, because the Chicago Landlord Tenant Ordinance prohibits excessive late fees. You may also be aware of a federal moratorium that comes out from the Centers on Disease Control, which is pretty similar to the governor's moratorium. Now, up until, this was my slide up until last Friday, and then I just added the big question mark because the governor's moratorium was broader than the CDC moratorium. Uh, it still is broader in some ways. It is more narrow in other ways. Uh, at this point, I think either a CDC uh, declaration or a governor moratorium declaration would prevent an eviction, but uh, it's just not a question that I can answer right now. Uh, remember, all of these laws are changing. No better example than today's presentation. You know, I have to keep up on the news and I, I alter these uh, slides uh, before most presentations. And I'll also say, Congress has got to act. Um, I know that they're going out of session for Thanksgiving now. They should be back in session for two weeks in December. You know, unfortunately, some, you know, talking heads say that maybe they won't act at all until January, until the um, Senate is completely decided. But people need relief and people need some clarity on these laws. Uh, what are we seeing instead? You may have some of these kind of problems. Uh, we're seeing lockouts. That's a definite part of our eviction prevention project. 
Um, by a lockout, I mean a landlord literally changing the lock so the tenant can't enter the premises, engaging in threatening and harassing behavior uh, or refusals to make necessary repairs. I'm not saying that anyone should engage in a painting project right now um, if they're not being paid, but um, you know, the number one thing that we see is uh, cut off utilities, like flipping a circuit breaker switch and then locking, putting a lock on the door to the circuit breaker so that tenants don't have electricity or don't have hot water. We're usually able to negotiate those if you have tenants, see tenants in that situation or if you advise landlords. I mean, it's just clearly illegal. The police will get involved people can be uh, issued a citation from the city. Um, it's just not not a good way. We're seeing some uptick in health and safety evictions uh, for some things that really are health and safety violations and we're not taking those cases. Some are kind of don't really seem that health and safety related to me. So, uh, uh, you know, if that's the only way to get into eviction court, it's a way that we've seen some landlords uh, use. We're also seeing some properties where people are, um, you know, this is something that happens anytime there's a disruption in the housing market where uh, a property is empty, say post foreclosure, real estate owned, someone with some knowledge, and I keep meaning, I'm sorry, I keep meaning to put real estate agent in quotation marks, because I don't mean, you know, real licensed agents. I'm talking about people with some knowledge of the system and uh, people will go in and rent thinking that they're renting from a legitimate agent um, and then find out that they are not and that they will be evicted. Um, I mean, it could happen to any of us. Uh, if, if you've ever been a renter, did you really do a title search? before you sign the lease. Probably not. I know that I never have, and, and I'm a lawyer. So, um, you know, we have a, a stack of cases like those, and we're trying to, to protect those tenants. I'm not talking about actual squatters who break in. Um, that's kind of a different legal problem. And I understand that that's happening too. All right, uh, this slide is actually supposed to be next to the one about the um, congressional action, but what we really need is Congress to, to pass some more housing assistance. I talk about housing assistance a lot because we administer those funds. Nearly every program I've ever personally worked with has given the money straight to the landlords, and that's I really encourage landlords and tenants to work together to get housing assistance to landlords. Uh, again, the genesis of our project is the idea that landlords don't really want to file evictions. And I, I'm going to um, say a little bit here that I know I've heard from landlords. I talked to landlord side lobbyists. I've heard some people say that they are shocked that tenants don't contact their landlords when they are behind. And I grew up in a pretty modest income household, and I am not shocked at all. You know, I kind of grew up knowing what days bills came in the mail and, and my parents, you know, pulling out the checking account and figuring out how much and which bills got paid. So I understand that the situation the tenants are in, it is a hard call to say, I can't pay my rent. You know, please don't evict me. Um, and we can be the intermediary for accomplishing that phone call. Call, uh, call us. We have five lawyers who are doing negotiating, the largest subgroup of us. Um, and sometimes they just give tenants advice and encouragement and self-empowerment, I hope. Uh, it's our goal to call their landlords. And sometimes we'll call their landlords on their behalf. Uh, if there is, if a landlord and tenant are working out an agreement, it should be in writing because remember back to that slide about the notice, only an agreement that is in writing 
will um, actually delay an eviction once the moratoriums are lifted. Doesn't have to be a fancy lawyer, you know, legalistic agreement. Uh, this is one that's written in plain language that's available on Illinois Legal Aid Online, which is a great resource for plain language legal information. Um, remember that emergency assistance payments can be used as part of a repayment agreement and the Chicago ordinance prohibits landlords from refusing to accept third party funds as part of the agreement. Uh, same number rentervention.com or that same phone number to reach us for emergency assistance or to talk with a lawyer. Oh, here he is. Uh, we call him Rennie, the Rentervention chatbot. Uh, people who are calling for legal assistance, um, you know, eviction court deadlines are very short. Call, I, I think I probably say that like three more times in these slides. Anyone who has court papers should not, you know, put them in a drawer and think that they shouldn't deal with them. Um, even if they understand that there's a rent uh, uh, eviction moratorium, you know, if, if you have those court papers, you know someone who does have them, call an attorney or an advocate who can help explain them. There are for profit attorneys who take eviction cases. Their mailings are fancier than ours, um, but there is access for free legal aid. Um, there are, are folks, and I know this very well, I have spent a lot of time in my career representing people impacted by HIV, but there are people who never thought that they'd be calling legal aid or a not-for-profit or asking for rental assistance who have been had their situation impacted by a pandemic pandemic sorry i'm going to take a drink of coffee here so uh our income guidelines are up to 80 percent of the area median income i think in the last three months we've only had to turn away one or two people because their income is too high it's like over $68,000 for a family of one, I think. Um, you know, most of our clients have very low incomes, uh, but we have some flexibility with that. You know, uh, different programs have different sort of guidelines. Uh, we fortunately don't have any immigration restrictions. So people can call us or they can use intervention, even if they don't have uh, legal documents. One good resource, I think I have their phone number coming up, Carpels, which uh, is a way for someone to navigate so that they're not calling like six different programs, figuring out whether they qualify. Carpels can help you figure out which program is best suited for you. Um, lawyers are gonna wanna look at paperwork. So if you can get your papers together ahead of time, and that is really tough right now. Uh, normally, I'm down in the loop every day. Our office is less than a block. If I cut it just right, I can walk from our office and only be outside for like a couple seconds. Um, you know, that all has changed. Try to have your documents together. It's really working out with people taking pictures with their phone and texting them these court papers um don't uh think oh i shouldn't call because i lost my court papers or i threw them away when i got them if you've got a court case but you don't have the court papers anymore still call us we'll figure out a way to get them here is the number for carpels we're just at a housing agency carpels can help answer questions in a lot of areas including consumer debt Again, Illinois Legal Aid Online, really good to bookmark anyone who works in constituent services or tenant advocacy or any kind of advocacy to look up um, legal, legal information sheets that you can print out. Uh, legal Aid Chicago um, especially uh, is uh, there for tenants with housing subsidies. 
And here we are, Lawyers Committee for Better Housing. Again, the phone number, the rentervention sites. Um, and uh, I should say, most programs have the capacity to do intakes in English or Spanish. I know Carpels, Legal Aid Chicago, Lawyers Committee, uh, and we have capacity to get an interpreter on the phone if we need another language. Uh, we're, uh, sorry, Lawyers Committee is not taking live calls right now because we're all working remotely. So uh, if you're giving someone our phone number, please encourage them to leave a message. We will call back within one business day, check their phone so that they're not blocking our number. Uh, and we are uh, even still working remotely. We're trying to make it work as all of us are doing. Um, and again, Rentervention is open 24 hours a day for people who want to chat to develop uh, any sort of uh, declarations or letters for landlords. Um, and is also uh, an intake tool for us that people can just stop by, do the declaration, or they can keep answering questions. Um, and um, uh, then, you know, so most of it is, comp you can go through Rentervention completely confidential without even disclosing your name. If it's gonna later on ask for like name and contact information, um, if you want us to, to call you back. So here we are, I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, turn off my timer, which tries to keep me uh, on task. Uh, so I don't just start going off and telling you old boy or war stories. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I think I can do the rentervention demo if people want. Um, or why don't we see if there are any questions and then we can go to rentervention if, um, if people would like to do that. Great. Thank you so much, Michelle. We really appreciate you sharing this information. I know that it's a lot to take in, especially when the rules are changing every moment. So I'm going to turn it over to Maggie. She will be asking some of the questions that have come in. And as a All reminder, right. if anybody has questions down at the bottom of your screen, there's a little Q&A um, icon that you can click on that will let you put in questions that you'd like to ask Michelle. All right, so our first question is, were there any additional protections added in the recent order for more vulnerable communities? that you know of, Michelle? No, there's nothing specific. The, uh, the only folks who are protected are the people who complete the declaration. Okay. Um, I understood that the declaration would be translated into other languages. The last time I checked, which was late Tuesday night, other mm -hmm. languages weren't posted yet. We are working okay. on translating the chat bot into Spanish to help complete the declaration in Spanish. Okay. And then our next question is, what are the requirements for a landlord to prove a tenant poses a health and safety risk? It's on, um, to me, it's a pretty high standard. I keep saying health and safety. There's actually, mm -hmm. There are three paragraphs. That's kind of just my shorthand. There's uh, three paragraphs that explain what's included. Uh, I think that it should be, uh, the way I understood it under the original, you know, the pre uh, last Friday moratorium was that the governor advocated a balancing test that having people evicted led to a public health problem. It led to um, community spread of the virus. That mm -hmm. would they would have to come to court. They would have to, to you know, somehow engage in moving or something. 
And so if they are more of a threat to public health because of their actions, for sure, like major drug involvement, guns, uh, like repeated wild parties with too many folks, you mm-hmm. know, uh, I, it, it's, uh, I, I, I hesitate to say this because it's a, a lawyer joke, but it's like some things you know it when you see it. You know, can you describe mm-hmm. green? Mm, no, but you know if something's green or not. It, it's easy for me to figure out like the extremes. And that's why we have judges. Um, you know, early on, I saw a case where uh, someone tried to allege it was a health and safety violation because they had found the tenant smoking weed twice. Well, the, it's not even illegal in Illinois anymore. So I, I thought that that was a pretty good example of not a violation. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then our next question is, how does it work if a roommate is not observing safety regarding COVID-19, which is putting another roommate at risk? Can the roommate make a complaint to the landlord? I would never having advised landlords, I would uh, think that a landlord would find that sort of a hot potato that they wouldn't want to get into. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, whether the tenant then, you know, whether the the tenant who's not observing safe protocol, uh, you know, somebody who's going out a lot, Mm -hmm. um, possibly bringing spread back into the, uh, you know, whether that person is a health and safety risk uh, is, uh, you know, a, a question for a landlord. I think, you know, whether they would want to file an eviction there. I mean, certainly if that were documented in a complaint, it's not a case that I would want to take. We all need to be working on this together. Um, and, um, oh, I know what I want to say about that. It might be a really good place for the tenant to try to engage the uh, uh, some sort of community mediation, perhaps one of the tenant advocacy groups or the Center for Conflict Resolution, I can pull up that number. I mean, they're very involved in landlord-tenant negotiation. Mm -hmm. uh, And I think that this is a place that they might be able to help the tenant who is at risk to negotiate something with their their co-tenant. Okay, perfect. All right, and then, there is a question about going back to a slide, but I think we can we'll we can do that when you go through the rentervention website, if that's okay. So I'll just leave that one for now. Um, and then our next question is, what are the options a tenant has if the landlord has not followed the proper procedures to notify of a filing for eviction? I'm sorry. Could you just ask that again? I- just, so oh, just yeah, ask the question no. again. <laughs> what are the <laughs> options a tenant has if the landlord has not followed the proper procedures for notifying the tenant of a filing for eviction? I would recommend that the tenant call an attorney. Okay. Uh, they, they can call our office or go to Carpels and get a referral, mm-hmm. you know, depending on their situation. Um, in eviction court, about 75% of the time, landlords have attorneys. Only about 10% of the time do tenants have attorneys. Uh, and you know, not a big surprise having a te- having a li- uh, having an attorney on both sides levels the playing field. Uh, so there are definitely options. We are taking those cases. We're getting cases dismissed if the landlord doesn't follow the proper procedure. Okay. I noticed there's a question in the chat too. Yes, I'm gonna finish out or. If okay. um, people are writing questions in the chat, I would recommend moving them over to the Q&A, but I also will be moving back to the chat box to cover those questions as well, if, if you do want to just leave them there. Um, okay. okay, our next question is, how about if there are mental health issues that are causing the health and safety violation, um, I think, and this is more pertaining to subsidized housing? Yeah, I mean, we have absolutely seen those evictions, mm-hmm. um, and, and I, I, 
actually the situation that I was involved in, I think it was in the 46th Ward. Um, I would recommend it, it, if possible that those clients also contact a legal aid agency, mm -hmm. uh, both, I was going to say both, but I know um, our office, Legal Aid Chicago, Cabrini Green Legal Aid, Legal Aid Society as well, have access to social workers uh, that can help connect uh, the tenants, you know, either coordinate with that tenant's provider mm -hmm. um, or help connect the tenant to um, uh, mental health services. It, you know, it's possible that it's an appropriate case or situation for a reasonable accommodation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I mean, I can, I can, I can get both sides on that. Uh, but, you know, it, it's really best if lawyers and social workers can get involved. And, uh, and, and the sheriff's office feels that way too. The, the sheriff's office has a social work department. Uh, you know, I, it is tough to be the person or the office that executes eviction orders and no one has ever done it better than our sheriff has. Um, by, you know, especially if other reasons, but especially by creating this social work department. And if the social work, if the sheriff's office knows that there are mental health issues involved, that mm -hmm. they get their social work office involved as well um, and uh, try to find appropriate placement for the tenant. Okay. Um, and then our next question is, where would a tenant whose lease was not renewed fit into the eviction picture during COVID? So yeah. if the tenant refuses to move. So up until Friday, that tenant was protected by the governor's moratorium because, you know, again, we have the big circle mm -hmm. with only the little circle of people who could be evicted. So unless that tenant uh, was creating a health and safety violation, that tenant couldn't be evicted. I don't think it was what was intended, you know, the changing of colors of the circles mm -hmm. um, means that the landlord could file an eviction against that tenant now, unless the tenant provides the declaration that the, um, they have not paid rent um, and they haven't paid rent because of COVID. So if the, the tenant provides a declaration, they can't be evicted. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if they're completely, it, it's maybe sort of ironic, but if they haven't moved because there have been orders encouraging us to stay at home, and, but they're able to work remotely and pay the rent, that person could be evicted under the governor's moratorium. Uh, okay. I know that the governor, I, I've heard other people discouraging landlords from, from evicting those people because eviction is bad for public health. Um, but the honest answer is they could be evicted if they don't provide the declaration. Okay. And then, um, looks like our last question before we maybe move on to um, your overview of rentervention.com. Um, are smaller landlords exempt from these eviction moratoriums? Asking because I know that certain independent landlords are loopholed out of federal fair housing laws. Yeah, so the eviction moratoria haven't addressed the uh, uh, you know, any of the exceptions for smaller landlords. So uh, often federal fair housing laws, the Chicago Residential Landlord Tenant Ordinance, the proposed Cook County Ordinance, sometimes the state law will say this is the process that landlords have to file and then we'll mm -hmm. follow, and then we'll create an exception for smaller landlords. So, you know, like the, the kind of, <laughs> Complicated rules on security deposits in the Chicago ordinance don't apply if it's an owner-occupied property. But there are no, there are no, generally no exceptions like that in the Eviction Act, which mm -hmm. applies to all. I mean, it applies to commercial and residential evictions. Um, and there are no uh, smaller, I mean, that, that 
could have made some sense in an economic standpoint, but it's never been part of the eviction moratorium. Okay. And then um, I believe this is what the word was, but can someone get evicted due to the behavior of their guest? So I guess um, if someone is living with someone else who's not on the lease. Uh, someone can get evicted for the behavior of their guest, even if the mm -hmm. guest is over, um, you know, for the evening, mm -hmm. depending okay. on what the behavior is. Okay. Um, this issue comes up a lot in subsidized housing, mm -hmm. uh, but also in private market housing. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, it it has to be serious. The, the more serious it is, it might only need to have happened one time. Mm -hmm. You know, bringing a gun in the house um, can get you evicted from subsidized housing even if it happens just one time. Um, and if that person, and actually, I've seen evictions that are based on the activity of the guest of a guest. So, like, I let my son stay here for break and he brings his friend home and then the friend brings in a guy. Uh, so uh, the answer is definitely yes. It's a little bit more of an issue now because people have allowed people to stay with them, the mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, but, it, you know, it, subsidized housing really is a major benefit, you know, it is property um, without like getting too lawyerly here. Uh, people ha have a right, uh, a housing voucher or the right to live in a project-based subsidy or a CHA building it is a pretty significant economic right. I've spent most of my career in working with people with subsidized housing and vouchers. And, you know, if somebody were trying to take my apartment, I would call a lawyer. And definitely somebody with subsidized housing, because it's not just about like where you're staying right now. It's that right to the subsidy. Okay. Uh, right. And I think we've worked our way through all of the questions right now. Um, so Michelle, if you wouldn't mind running us through rentervention.com. And then if anyone else has any last minute questions they would like to submit, now would be the time while Michelle's going over the website and then we can run through them at the end. So the, the little robot pops up and I want to say, hmm, I need help with preventing eviction and applying for assistance. And then, yes, yeah, I'll just use my zip code. I know I know we have a lot of Northsiders here. Sorry, I'm a Southsider. Uh, and then it'll just start asking you some questions. And then, so it will help generate, I'll go through the generating the uh, uh, declaration I've done it a couple of times, so I don't actually have to read it. So it's going to ask me an income question. And say I lost my income. Oops, oops, oops. And then, it, could it do it faster? Yes. But we are having it do each question because here, I'm not just checking out a box that says yes, it's yes, I swear, because each of these things need to be true. And people, you know, I've said this before, but people should not say it's true if it's not true. So did I try to make partial payments to the best that I can, knowing that I had other expenses? So yes, I swear. And then if I were evicted, would I become homeless or have to move in with others? Do I understand that I still need to pay rent? 
do I understand that the landlord can keep charging me rent and fees? And that the landlord could file a case against me after the moratorium is over. So yes, I understand. And then I understand I'm signing it under penalty of perjury that could result in uh, jail time fines or penalties. And then, you know, I might, you know, you can, if I hit this, never mind, it actually, I could leave now, I could come back for reasons that I do not understand. It, when I sign on again, it will know it's me, you know, because of my IP address or something like that. And it'll ask me whether I want to go back to where I was before or start over again. But here I'm going to say, okay. And then, you know, it's just going to ask me some information. And um, I've already done this one, so I'm not going to make it do it again. But it'll ask me this information so it'll complete the letter. It'll send it to my email address. And then once I get it, I can um, forward it. I'm going to um, come back up here. I'm going to do again. See, it'll ask me if I want to continue, but now I'm going to start over again. And say I'm going to do something else. I want help negotiating with my landlord. Like I know already, I've read and I don't want to do the declaration. So now I don't want to do the declaration. It, it's asking whether I want to, whether I live in Chicago because different rules apply in different areas. So, uh, so here I'm going to say market rent. It's going to give me some advice. This is going to let me do the uh, COVID. If I haven't uh, given my landlord in writing notice of COVID economic impact, it'll help develop that. I'm going to say, yes, I told them already. Uh, you know, have I received an eviction notice? It will, uh, you know, can someone here, can someone help me negotiate? And then it will help see how, as I've gone through this, not until I say, yes, I'd like to get connected, has it even asked me uh, any contact information. So someone I w was doing a presentation recently and someone asked a question or, or raised the concern that people with legal documentation are concerned about handing over any information. Can they go through intervention? And um, I explain you can go through the chat bot, you can get information uh, without giving any contact information at all. You know, it, not until the point you're going to click on a few things and you want to talk to a lawyer. Well, obviously, if he needs to call you back, then we need to get some contact information. It also, everything that you type in, like address, phone number, will go into the computer program. So, like, if you've typed in your landlord's name, then we don't have to ask you that again. Um, I can't get too technical. I don't know how it works. It seems like magic. I, I just do know that it does work. Awesome. And then I think our last question, if you wouldn't mind, Michelle, um, and I know for everyone, we will be sharing the slides with you um, via email at the end of the presentation. But someone was wondering if you could go back to the slide before the Illinois Legal Aid info. Oh, yeah, let me. Um, okay. I think I'll just do it with the screen sharing thing. Okay. Isn't this all amazing? Like, did people even know this? This all existed in February. I know. <laughs> you can see what I go to I immediately. Illinois Legal Aid Online. It also, um, you know. We'll do I don't want to get competitive or anything uh, between different websites. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, um, let's see. Maybe this is, I obviously use one dimensional at once. So, okay, here we go. I wanted to find out something about housing. So I went up here and it said, oh yeah, housing. So then it showed me here are different uh, resources about eviction. And, and this is, I mean, obviously both Rentervention, Illinois Legal Aid Online are not just about coronavirus. Mm -hmm. It's obviously something that's getting a lot of questions right yeah. now. Here's a blog post it'll list sent mm -hmm. to you. But as I said, this is really good if, if um, you know, for people to bookmark and go back to mm -hmm. foreclosure. Uh, Michelle, just, just to um, clarify something really quick. So the declaration is for the entire state of Illinois, correct? Absolutely. Okay. And, and we have uh, we have gotten more visits to intervention from outside of Cook County in the last week than I mean I, I don't actually know statistically, but mm -hmm. over the weekend we got something like six hundred visits to intervention and four hundred of them were from outside of Cook County. Uh, don't quote me on those numbers, but it's a lot because the same declaration applies throughout the state. Okay. Well, it looks like we don't have any more questions. I really appreciate so much uh, the Alderman's office for making available, you know, organizing this presentation. I hope. Uh, it has been helpful to people. It is very timely. Please, if you know anyone in this information, share the information about the governor's declaration. Um, because as I've said probably too many times now, it doesn't matter if it's true. It only matters if it's in the declaration. Thank you so much, Michelle. We're so grateful Thank that you're you. here. Thank you for sharing this information. For folks who attended this event, we'll be following up with the slide deck. So if you have any questions, I've put Alderman Kappelman's contact information in the chat. We have shared the ways that you can get in touch with Lawyers Committee for Better Housing. If you or anyone you work with has any questions, please let us know or contact um, your alderman in your area because a lot of them have worked with Michelle and have seen this presentation as well. So thank you all yeah. so much. Uh, if I might say just one word, if you are here representing uh, an organization, if you work for a tenants group, if you volunteer with a tenants group, a ward organization, your church, three warm bodies who care about tenants' rights, we have uh, this presentation. Um, we have a shorter presentation that we can pop into a meeting and talk for 10 minutes and answer questions. We have uh, the capacity to do it in English or Spanish. We don't have the slides in Spanish because we have to change them too often, but we can talk through it in Spanish. And um, I have four people, I would say, in our group who are ready to do presentations and with Zoom, you know, you really can just be a little piece of an agenda and just click in. So. We will do anything to get the word out. One final piece that we should mention is that right now the funding for the eviction prevention program goes through the end of 2020. So December 31st, 2020. I know that there is some hope that the any unspent funds will be able to be used in 2021. Um, so both for this um, increased number of attorneys who are working on this project and the increased amount of rental assistance. This is potentially time limited. So please take advantage of it now. Thank you so much. Enjoy yeah. the rest of your day. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. All right.